You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Emergency nuclear response plans have been around as long as nuclear weapons. And they have come a long way over the past 80 years. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. In a better world, we might have abandoned them by now, or at least not need to update them so often. But we don't live in a better world, especially not right now. Welcome back. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Russian troops of putting objects resembling explosives at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Officials have issued guidance. It's not just Ukraine and its European neighbors preparing for a potential catastrophe. Canada's government recently updated its own protocols, mostly to respond to a potential nuclear accident in Ukraine and keep Canadians near the area safe, but also to update plans in response to a nuclear weapons exchange stemming from Russia's invasion. What are those protocols? What do we know about them? How do they apply to Canadians in any event and in the event of a worst-case scenario? How likely are those scenarios, really? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Ed Waller is the NSERC Senior Industrial Research Chair in Health Physics and Environmental Safety, as well as a professor in the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science at Ontario Tech U. Hi, Ed. Hello, Jordan. How are you? I'm great. Uh, I'm trying not to be worried about our nuclear protocols being updated. Yourself? I'm not worried. I'm, I'm actually encouraged that we are updating our protocols. Okay, well, before we get to the updates specifically, maybe just in general, what kind of emergency protocols has Canada had in place for nuclear disasters? And and when were they last updated? I was only joking in the intro when I played a clip of Duck and Cover, but these things have been around for a while. Uh, that's correct. Um, you know, Canada's got a long history of developing nuclear technology. And along with that, we have developed emergency plans for the unlikely event that we do have an emergency. We operate under what I would call the Federal Emergency Response Plan that was last updated in 2011. So under that Federal Emergency Response Plan, we have what's called the Federal Nuclear Emergency Response Plan that was last officially updated in 2014. And that covers all types of nuclear and radiological emergencies. Now, that plan refers to provincial plans. So all the provinces also have their plans. And then in provinces like Ontario, where we have nuclear, a lot of nuclear plants, the utilities all have their own plans too. So there's a tiered structure of emergency response plans in Canada. Last week, we learned that uh, at the very least, I believe on the federal level, that plan is being updated. Uh, Why might that be happening at this time, given the global context? Right. I should point out, uh, before I address that explicitly, that we continuously update these plans. Right. So we're continuously looking at threats, different threats on the threat spectrum. And the government is continuously looking at the plan and saying, based upon the current threats that we have, are we capable of responding within the context of the plan? And the answer is usually yes. If we've perceived that there's a gap, then we address it and we update the plan. The difference that we have here, and we've had for the for the last couple of years, is that we now have a situation in Ukraine where the largest nuclear power plant in Europe has been taken over by an armed military. That's never happened in the history of the world. Mm-hmm. So the government said, okay, based upon this, we need to look at the plan and the protective actions that we have in that plan, the strategies that we have, will they still meet this new current threat? What are the ranges of that current threat? I mean, on the one hand, the largest nuclear plant in Europe uh, being held hostage is terrifying. On the other hand, it is in Europe, and I'm, I'm not trying to mitigate that risk to that continent and the people there, but what, what impact could that have on Canada? 
Very little. If we think about, you know, a very catastrophic accident that happened, Chernobyl, there was very little impact in Canada. Right now, the Zafirisia nuclear power plant is in what we call a cold shutdown state. So um, they've basically turned the plant off. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't a, a risk there because we still have the fuel in the reactor. But the possibility of having, for example, a steam explosion based upon the fuel is as low as it's going to get. Where the threat could possibly be to Canadians would be in Ukraine and possibly the surrounding countries where Canadians could be. What about beyond that power plant specifically? Because uh, as I understand it, and obviously you'll know better than I, there are also emergency protocols and plans in place for uh, the event that this conflict escalates to the point of an exchange, which is obviously the worst case scenario, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's a completely different uh, animal. And um, Canada has been updating their uh, missile warning protocol for, for quite a while. Now, I, I know less about that because it's highly classified what the protocol is, what countermeasures we have. And, and of course, in Canada, we don't have nuclear weapons, but our nearest neighbor does. And so when we're talking exchanges, you know, we're, we're kind of in the middle, mm -hmm. in, in, in my opinion. But we've had missile warning protocols in place since the Cold War. And those have been updated. Our technology has been updated based upon newer threats. But the specifics of that, honestly, I have not seen and I'm likely not to see. <laughs> right. In terms of the power plant, what could happen were an accident to occur to the surrounding area, Canadians, Ukrainians, Europeans? What is the danger there, uh, if not at a Chernobyl level? Like, what actually happens, I guess? Nuclear reactor obviously uses uh, nuclear fuel. There are, are, are what we call fission products or radioactive elements within that fuel. When we're in a cold shutdown state, the possibility of having a catastrophic accident is minimized. I think what a lot of people have been looking at as, as a current major threat uh, to that plant would be the use of, for example, explosives by an enemy force or shelling. Now, nuclear plants are what we call hard targets. They're extremely resilient. They're gigantic concrete structures. There's lots of water in the reactor. They're designed to withstand aircraft hitting into them without causing an accident. Oh, so wow. if, say, for example, there was some event that involved um, high energy explosives that, that have gotten into the plant because nuclear plants aren't designed to have a foreign force come in and put explosives in there. Yes. And, and that was what we heard, uh, allegedly at least, I guess, from a uh, Ukrainian president might be going on. Correct. And there's been no evidence of that yet found. Now, the um, International Atomic Energy Agency has inspectors in all the plants, including Zafirisia, some of the reporting that I've seen has not given any indication that there's any explosives on the plant. There, there was some talk about maybe there being explosives on the roof of the plant, but none of this has been confirmed. What kind of protocols, if you can give any details, not, not about the nuclear exchange, we could potentially talk about what we don't know about that later, but in terms of uh, what Canada would be doing for Canadians around there in the event of an accident, what kinds of things would these protocols contain? Right. So we have a number of protective actions under our nuclear emergency response plans that can include things like sheltering, uh, evacuation of personnel, so-called potassium iodide pills, or what we call iodine thyroid blocking agents, and also food restrictions. And we have deployed um, potassium iodide pills uh, into the region to the embassies and 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 um, surrounding embassies. Can you explain those just for people who aren't familiar with them? What are they? Sure. Um, it, it's stable iodine, essentially. When you take the pill, that iodine will go to your thyroid. It will saturate your thyroid with non-radioactive iodine, if there happens to be a release from containment, because iodine is volatile and it will go up into the air and, and, and dis distribute, um, if radioactive iodine, you inhale it or ingest it, it will try to go to your thyroid. But since you, you've completely saturated your thyroid with non-radioactive iodine, you essentially pee it out. <laughs> and so we've distributed that to Canadians in and around the area. That's my understanding, yes.
What happens next in terms of this plant and our emergency plans? Like, is this a living document? Um, do we release these plans or is this sort of based on what you've heard or what's been said about it? Like, I'm trying to gauge uh, the level of the level of transparency here. Well, our, our federal nuclear emergency um, response plan can be downloaded from the Government of Canada website. So there's nothing secret about it. Okay. The distribution of, of assets, sometimes it may be classified or hidden. Other times it can be open. So the distribution of potassium iodide pills, there's nothing really secret about it. We, we distribute them around our nuclear plants in the extremely unlikely event that there would ever be a problem. And, and all countries do this. This is not, there's nothing new here. What about beyond that? And this is where we get into the classified stuff. I know obviously you and nobody else can really speak to the specifics of it. But I guess my question is, how far has our potential response come since the days of the Cold War? Like, what do we do differently? I joked again about duck and cover, but when we just talked there, you talked about sheltering and that kind of stuff. Like, what tools do we have? Uh, should Canadians come at risk from this? Well, I think the biggest tools that we have is that Canada and the U.S. Uh, through NORAD, we've improved our ability to detect uh, newer types of weapons. For example, hypersonic missiles that weren't around during the Cold War. In my opinion, one of the biggest things we have going for us is we have a well-coordinated communication strategy because communications is really one of the most important things to be able to get a message out there in a um, unified fashion to the people that need to know, to the media, and there's no, no conflicting messages. Has there been any... Increasing conversation, I guess, in your world about the potential for either nuclear accidents or nuclear exchanges. This is something I think um, people casually, since the beginning of this invasion in Ukraine, I mean, it was one of the first questions that we asked, that most of the media asked, you know, could this result in uh, a nuclear country like Russia using these weapons? And there have been various rumors at various times in the conflict. What's the conversation about that like in your world? If, if we talk about the nuclear plant specifically, there was definitely more concern when the plant was operating at power. Now that it's in a cold shutdown state, it, it's, it's really at a safe level. There's no concern to Canadians on Canadian soil and really minimal concern to Canadians in Europe. Even if you go as, as far away as Kiev, there's really minimal concern, in my opinion. Hmm. Uh, as far as uh, missiles, you know, this is kind of a, a wild card. I, I think that, um, you know, we've, we've had um, Vladimir Putin talk about uh, the potential use. Uh, my personal opinion is that it's just posturing against NATO. And obviously, the use of any nuclear weapons would be catastrophic worldwide. As a nuclear safety expert, what does keep you up at night if it's not the worst case scenario you just mentioned? Honestly, I think that we, as far as our Canadian planning, all levels of government have done an excellent job to coordinate the various uh, governmental agencies to respond under their different mandates. That's not something often said as a strong suit amongst uh Federal provincial communications. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I see the government does a lot of exercising, tabletop exercises, physical exercises to you know ensure that the different agencies can work together. And I, I think we are actually doing a great job and a great job of um, coordinating communications it, again in the unlikely event that 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 there's some sort of nuclear event. So honestly, you know, right now, none of this is keeping me awake. I was more concerned, certainly, when, when the plants were at power and armed forces were within. But I think now, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting good sleep, Jordan. <laughs> That's good, because I think a lot of people uh, had perhaps a, a little bit of an inverse reaction when seeing that these documents were being updated last week. It's the kind of thing that, that brings to mind, well, if the government is thinking about this right now, uh, maybe I should. Certainly, but I think once you realize that this is not a new thing, the updating of these documents, this is so, an ongoing process, it, it, it puts it into a better perspective. And, and, and mm -hmm. what the government's doing now is looking at a new threat and saying, 
you know, do we still have assured ability to respond? And, and my personal belief, to, the answer to that is yes, we do have the ability to respond. I really appreciate you walking us through this. While I have you here um, on the nuclear power question, because just yesterday we did an episode about how we transform Canada's power grid for the future, I know Ontario is looking at small reactors as uh, a potential source of clean energy. It seems like this will become a larger part of our power grid uh, as we move away from fossil fuels. What is critical from your point of view during that transition? I don't entirely think we're transiting, I guess would be, hmm. would be my answer to that, is that we're, we are adding to our ability. So to run industry, to whatnot, we need base load power. Introducing things like small modular reactors, which are inherently safer than our already safe larger reactors, right. it adds a, a great benefit to Canada in terms of base load energy. Because we really only have a couple of choices. We either reduce our energy consumption or we add to base load. How would that change the protocols if we were to add, you know, more of these in more places? Um, I guess is my real question. Does it make it a more complex discussion when you don't just focus on, say, a handful of large nuclear plants? There, there's maybe a little bit more administrative load, but I, but the actual protocols, uh, sure, we have to re review them because if we're adding a new type of energy source. It has to be looked at in terms of our, of our abilities to run these plants and respond. But I, it, uh, honestly, I don't think it changes very much. Ed, thank you so much for this. I learned a lot. Thank you for um, allowing me on, Jordan. I, I think, you know, my, my, my last comment would be uh, keep calm and carry on. Wonderful. That's much better than duck and cover. Right. <laughs> Thanks again. No worries and thank you. Ed Waller, professor in the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science at Ontario Tech U. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find all of our episodes, including yesterday's, which I mentioned to Ed, right there. You can also offer us feedback in many ways, and we love to hear it. We take it to heart. The first way is by finding us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. The second way is via email. The address is hello at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca. And finally, you can call us and leave us a voicemail at 416-935-5935. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. <laughs>